We've probably invested more like collectively than $100 billion yet. How many autonomous vehicles do you see uh, driving around? Especially you and I live in Montreal. There's uh, what we got about uh, 12 inches of snow yesterday. I really don't see any of these like fancy California style cars that are driving in San Francisco being able to, to drive today. So that we have a long, long way to go still. You know, a kid doesn't need that much data to learn the difference between a cat and a dog, right? How come a machine learning algorithm them still needs, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of images to, to learn. So I really think that we're going to see like really more and more different uh, initiatives to try to reduce our needs on the sheer amount of data, on the computation that is needed, and even like obviously change a little bit of the architecture. It's not going to be transformers forever. This is an interview with Jerome Pasquero. Jerome is currently the director of machine learning at Sama, a company involved in the data annotation process. So in this interview, we dive into the data. We cover what's it used for, how do we build those big data sets, the difference between using AI or humans, how many humans do you need, and much more details. It's a very insightful and accessible discussion about building current artificial intelligence systems. I'm sure you'll love it, and if you do, please don't forget to leave a like and a five-star review depending on where you are listening. It helps the channel a lot. Let's dive right into it. So hi, I, I'm uh, Jerome uh, Pesquero. I uh, lead the machine learning team at uh, Sama here in Montreal. Sama is uh, a company that does uh, data labeling for all of the biggest players in uh, AI in the world. But we're also a, a company um, with a social mission. So, uh, we have, we're an impact company. Uh, our objective is to pull people from uh, poverty in East Africa or to uh, give them uh, access to jobs that um, they wouldn't have access to. Uh, we aspire to uh, be a bridge employer, employer when, uh, when that's possible uh, it, because jobs are just very hard to, to get in East Africa. Uh, I'm talking here specifically about uh, the two countries we're in, which are... Uh, in, in Kenya, so in Nairobi and in Uganda. Um, and um, we believe that uh, data enrichment workers, what I've been calling annotators, uh, for instance, have a role to play. They probably have a really important role to play in this uh, AI revolution. And we don't want to leave them behind. Uh, today, like I said, we can have them do some you know, more tedious and smaller tasks as the models are kind of learning how to uh, perform these tasks. But I'd love to see them kind of grow uh, with the models as well and eventually become uh, what we were talking about, uh, uh, model supervisors, uh, model, uh, model teachers even. But that's going to be a process that there's no guarantee that will be done. But I think we're, we have a unique opportunity of having a new breed of jobs that uh, starts from, you know, uh, parts of the world that are not used to uh, seeing these emerging new jobs, right? For once, like maybe this can happen uh, in these parts of the world where uh, a certain part of the expertise in AI comes from, uh, you know, East Africa, for, for instance. Um, so again, I have a lot of, to say about this, but just wanted to mention it to your uh, listeners uh, and if they're interested, of course, we have uh, we have a, a website, sama.com, just to read about uh, how we try to uh, implement change in what is kind of a, a weird industry, the, the, the huge uh, under uh, unknown industry of, of uh, data labeling that actually fuels uh, uh, modern AI. And i um, really happy to be on this uh, podcast. Ray. I'm happy to have you. And yeah, how did you get into the field? How did you start with data? Oof, I think it goes way back. So I've always been interested in, in AI uh, from my early years in electrical engineering. But back then, uh, there was no such thing as a deep uh, learning network, a deep neural network. Um, there was no neural networks, but they weren't really deep. But it was already pretty clear that the importance of data for, for training uh, models uh, back then. Uh, and my career path uh, took me to really different uh, places. Uh, I, you know, played a role in the uh, mobile phone uh, development, a small role in mobile phone development into two thousands. But when AI started exploding around, uh, you know, mid two thousand tens, 
um, and that it started to really explode even more in, in Montreal. Uh, I wanted it. Uh, and there was a company that was starting uh, back then called Element AI. So I did everything I could to uh, uh, find a role for me um, over there. And uh, that's where um, I was really introduced to AI in a commercial setting. And you mentioned you, you first learned about AI in school and you, you were interested, but what was it like in those days and when was this exactly? Oh, so it would have been around uh, 2000, uh, probably when I was doing my master's. Um, yeah, there was a few advanced courses uh, for master's and PhD in AI um, that use some of the books, I think, are, that are still used today. They've probably been updated. One that I can remember is the... Um, Uh, artificial intelligence a modern approach by uh, Russell and Norvig uh, uh, and that's those books would introduce you to uh, reinforcement learning to neural networks and a number of other um, what we would call classic uh, machine learning uh, algorithms and techniques did you think it it was promising like how did you know it would lead to something with since it couldn't really be used or, or trained in, a, in an efficient way I don't know that I saw it as being really promising. Uh, I wasn't trying to predict the future, and I don't think I would have been able to in any case. Uh, but I did find it super exciting, for sure. Uh, we would use some of these te techniques uh, to do um, to do competitions. Like we, there was a there was a competition back the, 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 then called the, I think the RoboCup competition, which was either done in software or you could do it with real like uh, little uh, robots. Um, we played with the software version of it and tried to implement uh, neural network or reinforcement learning. It didn't work very well. It didn't work at all, but it was super fun I, just to get to implement some of, some of these algorithms. So no, back then, um, it wasn't clear at all that, that's, uh, that, was, that would become eventually the future of uh, modern AI. Uh, but it was clearly um, something that was uh, different and, uh, and exciting. What was most exciting to you about the field? Just for example, in, in my case, when I first discovered artificial intelligence towards the end of my engineering degree, it's basically uh, that I finally found that mathematics could be applied to something useful. And I loved anything logical and math related. So I, I just found it was the, the, the perfect blend between like applicable and, and science. And that was super exciting to me. But what was this exciting part around artificial intelligence for you? Yeah, I wouldn't say that it was uh, uh, similar to you because I've always thought that like math and uh, or could be applied to stuff that was really helpful. So that was, you know, I used to do computer vision at a company today, uh, a company that today still exists is called Matrox. They used to do uh, uh, graphic cards before NVIDIA took over <laughs> in the 90s. Uh, and, you know, like math and, and computer vision was super helpful back then. Uh, what I thought was super interesting about AI is just that we were trying to mimic um, what humans can do, right? That's yeah. what I find it extremely uh, exciting. From a sensory point of view, like so the input to the human and then the processing within the human brain and the output of like what, uh, what you know, what we, we do as humans as, as actions. Uh, and, and like just to trying to reproduce who we are is, is what I find is, is fascinating. And do you think we are still going that route? For example, just uh, with current systems, I guess the whole goal is to scale up all the, the transformers, the size of the architectures, the size of the data sets. Do you think we are still trying to replicate how humans understand or are we like diverging away and just focusing on instant reward or... What's your opinion on that? That's a good question. I'd say it's a little bit of, of both in the sense that, yes, I think that any serious researcher in the field will tell you that they're trying to replicate what humans can do. And they'll say that what the, the current architectures, the current trends are probably not really matched to uh, exactly what humans can do, but that's what's working right now. So yeah. why not push it until it stops working? Because we are getting successful in replicating some of the human capabilities without necessarily replicating the, the real mechanisms, the underlying mechanism, mm. mechanisms of, of, the, of the brain, right? Uh, You'll hear these, these uh, prominent researchers say that we're throwing so much data, so much computation uh, at models today and so much repetition, like in supervised learning, it's crazy the number of times you need to repeat the same thing for the model to, or you know, something very similar for the model to learn. Whereas a kid, 
can learn really complicated concept with just a few examples. So clearly, we're not we're not we're, there's something we're not doing right uh, right uh but then like with the recent successes we've seen uh, over the past 10 years it's still super fun to see how uh the output at least is is starting to be matched to human capabilities i agree and we we've seen the i, th I think we've seen most progress of course with llms with chat gpt and everything most people if they know about computer vision or like n pe people that are not in the field that hear computer vision or like image stuff they think about Dali or mid journey or like generative ai where they you, you give it text and it creates images and we've seen the progress of these models recently but since you've been in the the computer vision industry for maybe 20 years what's changed in terms of other image tasks uh, other than the new generative ones oh i think uh, uh, a lot like we used to do computer vision by creating what we would call kernels or filters <laughs> uh, that would do really, really simple tasks uh, at first. So like detecting edges on uh, images, for instance. And once you detect an edge, well, then you can detect two edges that are um, uh, next to each other at a certain angle, right? And once you can detect two edges at a certain angle, maybe you can detect a closed shape. And every time this is a kind of a different uh, kernel or filter that you're applying on the image on top of each other. But you have to do all of this manually. And it's usually by trial and error. And it's informed by math, obviously. right? And at some point, you might get into like something that can uh, identify a face. But then you need to identify like whose face it is. So you would keep on like kind of building manually these uh, levels of abstraction on top of each other each time building on something that was a little bit shaky because none of these kernels were perfect. That's what how we used to do things. Today is completely different. Today what we do is we find a bunch of examples, at least in supervised learning, we use a bunch of examples of faces with the label, so the answer of what we would want the model to tell us, whether you know this is a face or whose face it is, or uh, is this face uh, uh, average or different than average. And we, we, we have all this labeled data, these examples, and we feed the models over and over and over again with examples like that until it kind of learns on its own how to uh, uh, process these images and give you the, uh, uh, the desired output. So a completely uh, different approach. And as it turns out, um, a more successful one than mm -hmm. uh, our initial attempts at uh, uh, computer vision. But it does come with its uh, set of, of issues and challenges because uh, in engineering, uh, nothing's perfect, right? Hmm. And now where you see it going, is the issue more on the, like the, the quality of the data, the intelligence of the architecture, like how, how well it can extract information or just uh, we need even more compute? Like where's the next step or where, uh, where is the computer vision field seems to, to be going? Yeah, I think there's going to be multiple uh, different paths that are running in parallel. I don't see the like uh, the one path we're seeing today of like kind of uh, adding more computational resources, uh, more data, <laughs> different architectures uh, uh, changing that much because it's still successful. It's still it's still kind of working. We're still improving on benchmarks, right? Um, but at the same time, people are starting to seriously ask whether this is uh, something that's sustainable. Uh, the problem is that it uses so much energy, so much compute. We're also now at a level where there's more compute than what you would have in a human brain. So again, clearly, the architectures we have today are not optimal, right? There's still mm -hmm. room for different architectures. So this would be another branch, another path that I see uh, running in parallel. Each well is going to feed the other because there are components that you can use from one like brute force approach in the other one, which is a little bit smarter. And a smarter path, what would it be? Well, can we do this this with less uh, data? Like as I mentioned earlier, you know, a kid doesn't need that much data to learn the difference between a cat and a dog, right? You show them three or four uh, cats and dogs, and they get it right away. How come a, a machine learning algorithm still needs you know thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of images to, to learn? Um, so I really think that we're going to see like really more and more uh, different uh, initiatives to, to to try to reduce our needs uh, on the sheer amount of data, on the computation that is needed, and even like obviously change a little bit of the architecture. It's not going to be transformers forever, uh, I believe. I agree. And for the the data, we also need something that is of 
super high quality versus just versus just scaling and having way more data. And so what is the importance of leveraging humans to annotate data versus having something that is using another machine learning model or something automated? Where where does the human come into play and why do we need them? Okay, that's an excellent question. It's one that I get asked quite often. And the way I try to frame this is uh, quite simple. Uh, machine learning or AI is really about um, basically figuring out a way to download human knowledge, human skills um, today into data that is used after for training the model so they can reproduce these uh, human, uh, human skills or, or be able to, um, uh, to generate that human knowledge, right? Uh, so it's kind of a, uh, yeah, an output from humans, from the human brain to data that again then is fed to, to, to the models. And, and that's how models uh, learn. So uh, a model can't learn on its own. Without that data that is generated by humans, it's not going to learn any, anything new. You can re, uh, reshuffle, repackage the data I- itself or what a, a model has learned um, to export it in a, and have it output in a different format. But there's not going to be any net new information if there's no humans kind of injecting that information into the system. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the jury's still out as how long it's going to take for models to reach uh, a general intelligence like uh, uh, AGI. Uh, but one thing's for sure, it's not happening tomorrow, which means humans still have a big role to play. Now, of course, the counter argument to this is that as we move away from supervised learning, which is where like the data is actually uh, labeled by the humans, and we move into stuff like semi-supervised or unsupervised, so large language model or models are often unsupervised. It uses like data that already exists and and doesn't need to be uh, uh, labeled. Um, maybe maybe we we can go at an accelerated rate in like transferring that information from uh, uh, you know human knowledge to, to 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 models. But I think that. Um, there's a fallacy in that, in that, in that thinking that um, you still need somewhere a human in that, in that loop to say whether what's produced by the model is correct, because you can't have a model assess itself. It's, it would do, be doing it in, in the void without any uh, grounding on, in reality. And, and we are, as humans, that grounding in reality. We are the ones who can supervise, tell, them, tell the models well, whether uh, they're doing the right thing or not. And, and and make the appropriate correction so that in the next iterations they're better and better. And and so, what are your thoughts on constitutional AI, where like you you give guidelines to a language model and it it gets corrected by GPT four or or whatever? It's kind of like a reinforcement learning with feedback, but AI generated feedback versus human one. Do you think this is promising or it it goes against downloading human skills? I think it's a tool that has a role to play. So using ML to do ML is definitely a way to accelerate accelerate certain things. But ultimately, you still need humans to be the ultimate judge. You still need humans to inject more knowledge into it. You still need humans to supervise the whole whole thing, uh, to generate the objectives and the goals, and to uh, extract value that ultimately only makes sense in a human world, right? Uh, so again, it's just, it's, just a, it's just one out of many tools, like ML for ML, basically, mm-hmm. that uh, we have at our disposal to, uh, to help that, that transfer of information from our brains to, uh, to models. Could you, could you give some specific examples on how you personally use ML to, to build other models or, or to build data sets? Yeah, for sure. So, for instance, um, one of the big problems, I'll, I'll stick to computer vision, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the big problems is that there's a lot of data out there. Uh, and uh, when our clients uh, come to us, um, they have a tendency to kind of like dump all their data on us and say like, okay, can you annotate this? And then they have very specific instructions. Uh, so far, so good, right? The problem is that they've never really looked at their data, <laughs> right, uh, themselves. It's too much. There's too much of it. Uh, and um, and sometimes they're also looking at some specific things. So an example, for instance, they might be looking at uh, annotating about many things, uh, cell phones and images. All right? They're looking for cell phones and they want to annotate them. 
but they have no idea how many cell phones are in all the the, uh, the images that they've given us to to annotate. And they want to prioritize this because their model is not do, they're doing very very well on cell phones. So we can use uh, ML to guide. Uh, looking for uh, cell phones in all the images that they've given us with a high likelihood. It's not a perfect uh, science, but it can, we can use ML to help us find those images that are most likely to have a cell phone so that after that we can annotate, like label that cell phone in whichever way uh, our, uh, our, our clients want um, and increase the, uh, the speed uh, at which we get to uh, you know, the, the, the right data for, for training the model. It's something that if we weren't using ML, we would just use brute force, look at every image, uh, try to find cell phone in every image. It would be a huge waste of time. We might be even annotating similar images that are not needed. Imagine like you have twice the same image, we would like, annotate it twice. Whereas here using ML, we can make sure that there's always kind of like, even if it's an image with the cell phone, it's an image that has a lot of value compared to all the other images that you have so far. And you're not constantly kind of like, relabeling similar things that have very value when you're actually training uh, training the model. And are you using any language models to do anything in your case, the, the new ones or the, the, the better ones? That's a very good question. So, you know, we, we talk about language models, but like very soon we'll be talking about multimodal uh, models. We're actually already talking about multimodal uh, uh, models. Yeah, for us, like for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, instructions, for instance. Instructions can be very, very long into the labeling process. There's no stand, uh, standard for uh, for how our, uh, our clients um, uh, provide us with the, the instructions for labeling. And that's a problem, right? Because every instruction is different. There's a lot of information. Some of these documents have hundreds of pages. That's where we could use a learn a large language model to actually standardize the data format of these language uh, of, the, of these instructions, right? For instance, mm. um, if we need clarification, like uh, during training phases, we we could use also large language models for uh, providing examples of uh, you know um, if uh, if I see a bicycle and there's a pedestrian uh, uh, a cyclist on it, should I annotate the cyclist and the bicycle at the same time uh, uh, as the same object, or should I do them as two different objects? So that's where a language model might be able to uh, uh, to help. So yes, of course, we're we're very aware of uh, <laughs> of uh, at some at, of uh, large language models. Uh, we constantly experiment with them, try to see how uh, you know it, it helps with our uh, ultimate goal, which is to provide the best uh, annotated data possible uh, at the cheapest uh, cost to our uh, to our clients, mm. and you are mainly using it as a tool again. I get to to download human knowledge and and make it like more efficient instead of like basically automating something that humans could do. And I really like how you you are focusing on. It's not an an intelligent thing that will replace us. It's like a tool that we can leverage. Yeah, that's the concept of like kind of uh, augmentation, a human augmentation. And it's uh, it's something that's really debated these days whether we can use AI as uh, you know uh, a means for human augmentations. Uh, people are actually some people are pushing back. I fundamentally believe that that's the way to do it. I actually think that uh, since the dawn of time, like whenever we introduce technology, it's in a human uh, reality, human context, which means mm -hmm. we use it so that we can augment our capabilities. Of course, part of this means like automation in certain areas, complete automation. Right? There's, you know, uh, and some of the jobs disappear that way. But ultimately, it's all about making ourselves better so we can move on to the more challenging problem that is, it can't be solved today. So we use the exact same philosophy. Uh, we very well know at, at Sama that if all we're doing is just throwing bodies at labeling stuff that models are, can already do, uh, it's a losing proposition for us, right? We'll rapidly be uh, replaced by those models. So we always have to be one or two steps ahead of what the models can do. Uh, and, uh, so that we continuously provide a value to our, our clients. And that means in order to, to, to stay in that race where we're ahead, uh, we use the existing tools, so the existing models to, to, to actually uh, uh, achieve our, our goals. Hey, this is a quick interruption to remind you to share the podcast with a friend. If you think the discussion was interesting or insightful, sharing it will make it so your friends think more of you. It's a two-in-one to share knowledge and also be seen more interesting. 
So please don't forget to share this episode with anyone you think will take value out of it. Thank you for listening to the episode and I will let you enjoy the rest. You mentioned that AI w will have an impact on, on jobs and basically just like all technology changes, it, it had impacts on the, the job market. Uh, I wonder what do you think will or is happening to the current jobs or like just our society because of, for instance, language models, but just AI in general. Is it mostly taking jobs for people? Is it creating new ones or just transforming? Like, w What will be the, the impact, you think? I don't have a crystal ball, but I would say that uh, the past is probably something we should look at if we're trying to <laughs> to, to, uh, to predict the future. And any transformative technology, and I think AI is just one of, the, of, of them, um, has uh, come with like a huge replacement of some jobs and an addition of uh, new jobs. Unfortunately, it's not necessarily the same people who are doing the new jobs and the old jobs. But uh, ultimately, most of the time, it's a, it's a positive outcome. Like there are more jobs that are created and that are destroyed or become obsolete. Um, I'm hoping that it'll be the same thing with AI. I think humans are very creative in finding ways of uh, tackling new challenges, again, that the, the current technology can't tackle on its, on its own. And um, I see no reason why this uh, uh, would stop just because now we have you know, large language models. So it's going to be disruptive and super disruptive in certain fields and super creative in others, right? And so you don't see it much difference in previous revolutions versus now? One definition of technology is that it's going to be more disruptive than a previous one, right? It's going to have a larger scale. It's it's how it is, right? I, yeah. So, so we shouldn't be surprised when the, a, a new revolution, a technological revolution, it seems to be you know an order of magnitude bigger than a previous one. But every time we're in those revolutions, we always think, oh, this is crazy. This is it, right? Uh, but yeah. there's no evidence then that that we're at the the, the end of that uh, of that line. When computers came out, people were like, "Well, I don't, you know, I don't need. We don't need computers." Which by uh, by then were uh, back then were uh, were people actually doing all the computation. When uh, mobile phones came out, people were like, "Oh, well, now I can talk to anyone anytime." Like, uh, you know, so so, so this is, is going to continue. Of course, every time we're in one of these revolutions. We should be careful. We should be mindful that it's going to come with like a bunch of uh, what's well, going to create losers and it's going to create uh, winners. And we have to be very careful about making sure that uh, wealth and knowledge is distributed equally. And every time it becomes a, an extra challenge, but every time we're also equipped with more technologies, more means, more uh, uh, um, uh, historical data to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I I, I don't like, you know, it's human nature to always think that they're really special and their time is really special. Like the yeah. time they live in is really special, but there's no, uh, if you take a very objective approach, there's no reason to think that we're different than, uh, you know, uh, 50 years ago, 100 years or 500 mm. years ago. This being said, I'm super excited about LLMs. It's one of the coolest things I've, I've tried uh, uh, over the last few years, right? Uh, and, and I think it's great to be embracing AI and to get excited and to, to push the envelope. And I think it's just as important to, to be mindful of like its uh, dangers, the, the pitfalls and, 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 and the fact that uh, it, like any technology, it's a double-edged sword and we have to be careful about uh, how we use it, implement it and, and, uh, and distribute it. But if the goal is to ultimately, just like Sam Altman, OpenAI or other companies, is to create AGI what is a, a future technology that can beat that? Like, what can be even more impressive than creating something that is intelligent enough to do everything on its own? And yeah, again, that's a good question. It's hard to know what you don't know, right? Or say yeah. hard to speculate about what you don't know. I think that, that my my main question is like, um, are I'd say I think it's pretty obvious that we're trending towards AGI or or even more super intelligence. Okay, I think everyone agrees with that. Given enough time and resources, and if we don't auto-destroy ourselves, we'll get there, right? The, the real question is, how long is it going to take? People think that we could achieve this in 20 years. Others think it's going to take 200 years. I'm just saying, I don't know at this point, right? And I, I don't think that anyone who says that they know knows better than, like, ha has any more information than, than, mm. than we do, right? So um, I wouldn't panic about this, right? Um, and I think once we get there, 
the human reality will be uh, slightly different in the sense that uh, maybe we'll be an uh, interplanet uh, <laughs> a species and then we'll have another set of, of challenges. Yeah, so if we're going into more kind of yeah. <laughs> into the future, uh, my, my main point over here is that uh, there's no reason to be uh, in a panic mode right now. Uh, we just have to be careful, like we've always had to be careful in the past, uh, and maybe maybe we do have to be a little bit more careful. But, but again, we we have experience that we didn't have before. We have tools that we didn't have before. So let's uh, let's leverage those. Yeah, I assume it's just one step for uh, one step further towards AGI as we've been as humans have been trying to do since like automating things even prior electricity and internet. So it's just always trying to automate tasks that we don't want to do. <laughs> And I mean, when the first computer beat, uh, you know, the, the, the chess masters, yeah. people were like, this is it. Like, we've solved AI, right? And then they're like, well, actually, there's more to it. And every time we solve a problem that we think is only of the realm uh, of uh, humans, there's always kind of a challenge after that, right, uh, that arises and that people try to tackle. So I don't see an end to that uh, until really, yeah, we... We solved, uh, you know, super intelligence at a very big scale, uh, which I think will happen at some point when, I don't know. And I want to go back on on uh, data to build those models. And how do you deal with qualitative tasks? Like, for example, it's easy to, to spot a cat in a picture. You just have a bounding box and it's clear and simple. But do you do you deal with any qualitative tasks where it's much more complex and it also depends on who's annotating? Yeah, so I would say we deal uh, exclusively in computer vision where there's a little less ambiguity in the tasks that we are asked uh, to perform in, in labeling. I'll give you an example. In, in, large, in, in NLP, in natural language processing, for instance, uh, the same sentence can have dif different interpretation uh, depending on you know cultural vices or, or even where you are in the in the world, right? In computer vision, a cat's a cat, right? This being said, because we are now kind of uh, going up in the ladder of like cognitive tasks that we're asked to tackle, there are sometimes now ambiguities that uh, arise. For instance, uh, asking whether. Uh, in the image, uh, there's going to be an accident. You you have an image of cars, and like you have to come up with an interpretation of what's going to happen next, for instance, right? And uh, whether it's going to be an accident or a near accident or stuff like that. That is a little bit more open to interpretation, but um, that's okay, right? Um, <laughs> it, I think we've been operating under the impression that there is a model that will serve everyone's, that's going to align with everyone, right? The, the, the concept mm -hmm. of alignment. But that's not true. Like, why should there be uh, models, uh, uh, one model for all, whereas we're all different as individuals? The reality is alignment is really at the individual level, right? And in order to do that, we do need first to capture all the nuances of how humans can interpret uh, the, uh, the, the reality. Uh, so yeah, we do see some, some examples where uh, we will ask multiple annotators to come up with an answer and knowing very well there's no real like hard ground truth and use that distribution um, to uh, to have a model that's a, a model that's a little bit more uh, nuanced. Uh, what's what's its strength? Are you dealing with biases the same way? For for example, if there's definitely a difference between annotators, even if it's a somewhat simple task, one might do like a slightly bigger box all the time versus others might be more tight or or whatever. Are you are you dealing with either multiple? annotations and doing averages or you are always trying to use the same person or just using as many people as possible to represent like the world as mo most accurately as possible how do you deal with that it really depends on uh, use cases so uh, in some cases we'll use uh, one annotator per task um, and then you know the the averaging process that you describe over here will happen naturally. So say we're both working on the same project, you see an image and you have to annotate 
a face, you might be very aggressive in how you annotate the face and the pixel tolerance make it very, very tight. And I'm a little bit loose because I include the hair, uh, you know, uh, coming out of the, the top of the head over here and I'm a little loose. But if we do this with like hundreds of annotator, uh, annotators or a thousand of annotators, um, the, the signal is going to average itself, right? right? So we don't really need to deal with this. That's one way of doing it. In some uh, other uh, use cases or, 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 or works uh, workspace uh, workflow sorry um, uh, will we will have uh, multiple annotators doing the exact same same task because there is inherent ambiguity that we really want to try to capture and model or that our clients want to model or inject into the in, in, into the, the, the models so and then there's like anything in between right <laughs> there are cases where we'll, we'll use uh, both techniques uh, uh, at the same time another important thing here is is the fact that the annotation process is a is a sequence of, of steps. So here we're just describing a, a single step, and in some cases you can have multiple steps uh, uh, that follow each other. And um, and one of the final steps for us is usually quality assurance, where we have our most experimented experienced um, annotators who look at the the output of what's been done in the steps before and decide whether it's ready for delivery or whether it needs to be corrected, in which case they might make the correction themselves. So they might like readjust for bias at that point, or they might just re-inject it into the whole uh, workflow so that it gets reworked with like additional instructions and, and, and guidance. And all these, like uh, the which technique to apply to which uh, use case is our expertise. That's what uh, you know we're good at. That's what we advise our, our, uh, our clients on uh, because we've been doing this for, forever. Would you have a specific example of uh, when you you are using only one person or, or very few one and not averaging? Yeah, I'd say for the enormous majority of the cases, we use uh, one person and then we use QA, right? But for instance, one use case where we uh, might use multiple people is um, when trying to assess whether uh, data that has been synthetically generated by our client is realistic or not. So they might send us, uh, it, it might be a company that uh, generates uh, synthetic uh, people in certain poses, right? So we're asked to look at all the data that they've generated and say whether this is, uh, you know, a motion or a pause or a pose that that is realistic, uh, whether the face has any flaws or not. So it's kind of open to interpretation, right? Because it's it can be difficult sometimes to say, oh, this this is a little off, but I'm not sure why, or this this is actually not realistic. If I saw this image, I would think that it's a, okay. That that it, it's possible. Um, and, and that's where, like, we would have uh, probably multiple where well, we annotators look at the same at the same data and and uh, and label it. Uh, and then what's important at the end is not necessarily to do the average between all these answers, but to really capture that distribution, <laughs> right? Because that distribution is is uh, is an important part of information that uh, any uh, any model would uh, would benefit from from having afterwards. Right? You mentioned synthetic data, and do you see, I believe that you are not often using them or creating them, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've heard you say that you you are not currently using many synthetic data. So I wonder what's your current opinion on the state of like automatically generated data just to grow the data set or to generate, for, for instance, like rare use case and generate more of them? Yeah. No. So uh, we we do get to annotate synthetic data. Some of our clients have synthetic data that they want us to uh, validate. Basically, that's a validation workflow, right? Yeah. Uh, my view on this is is pretty uh, classic. I think um, synthetic data in the uh, training of model has a role to play. It's one uh, a tool out of uh, of many tools. It's it's a useful tool, especially to kickstart a model when you have no data. But I still think that there's no uh, replacement for real hard data, right? And it's it's it comes down to the same thing we were talking about earlier. If you figured out how to generate uh, realistic, and by realistic, I mean not realistic just for a human, but realistic in the sense that it is mimicking real life data you know, very, very accurately. If you've, if you've figured out how to do this as a synthetic data generator or a company that does that, you've figured something about the world that actually the model is trying to 
figure out itself, but yeah. in the opposite direction and reverse engineering this from, from the data itself, right? Um, it also means that uh, you don't necessarily need to use uh, annotated data or to annotate data, right, for, for this, because you've understood something about like the physical world that otherwise you would need a, a model to reverse engineer. So uh, it comes down to, again, how much new information by generating this data are you actually uh, creating into yeah. the data that's generated? And, and most of the time, it's just very little. Uh, again, it has a role to play. You mentioned uh, you mentioned for the edge cases, sure, okay. But in order to know that these edge cases exist, it's still good to use the real data yeah. edge cases and maybe augment that real uh, the, this real uh, these edge cases. Um, you can try to come up and be creative by trying to think about these edge cases yourself, but that's going to be difficult because the whole uh, diff challenge of, of edge cases is that most of the time you don't know that it exists until you see them. <laughs> Um, and, and something that you could use in Data Data 4, as, as mentioned before, is also to kind of kickstart uh, the training of a model. If you have absolutely no data, it's a good idea to just get a really like, basic benchmark, start from there, and then you can improve uh, on it with uh, a combination of, of real and, and synthetic data. You validate a lot of synthetic data, but also do quality assurance on the annotate annotations you have. I, I don't know if you are using the same process for both, but how can you scale up this quality assurance and this validation for many, many images? So it's really a three-step process. The first one is about selecting the data that is going to be uh, seen, validated, analyzed by a pair of eyes, like by our workforce, right? Automated system, basically. Data curation. The tail end of that data curation does involve a human just for the last steps, because again, that's where a human will be the best judge of uh, what makes sense to annotate or not. But that's the first phase. Once you've identified the data that is worth analyzing, that is worth uh, uh, annotating or is worth validating, then you go to the pure annotation and validation and correction phase, right? That's where we have the most people. Um, that's where the mass is looking at it and, and trying to go through uh, as much as possible. Again, of that like really uh, filtered down uh, data that, you had as, a, as a, an input to the whole system, right? Um, and that's where you're injecting, a, a, again, a lot of uh, information from, from humans. And then a third part of this is really the quality assurance. Now, you don't need the same ratio of uh, people who are doing quality assurance than um, you don't need a one-to-one -one ratio between these people and the, the, doing, the ones doing the annotation because quality assurance can go a lot faster. As I said, it's usually the most experienced. Uh, uh, annotators or, or uh, data enrichment workers who are, are doing that on, on our end. Um, but that's where like, they kind of just readjust a little bit, resend re for uh, uh, annotation or for rework some of the stuff that is not right or correct of it themselves. So these are the, the, the three phases in some way are always kind of informing the, what is coming downstream from, from them. Uh, other than, than the example you, you just mentioned, when, when is AI or uh, any machine learning tool better than humans? Is it only for scaling up things or does does certain machine learning algorithms have better capacities than humans other than doing like many more iterations faster? Yeah, so two, two answers to that. Machine learning algorithms are better than humans once they got to that level of being better than humans. So today, for instance, if you if a client comes to us and say, I would like you to annotate dogs and cats from and, and cats. I would say that's nuts. <laughs> that's a problem that's solved already. Why are you wasting your time and money on this? Mm. Right? Um, so classification problems. Uh, trying to like we know machine uh, learning algorithms are really good at recognizing faces too, right? For instance. So there's a there's a long list, but not an infinite and not a complete list of problems that today we could consider being solved by computer vision. Uh, a big part of it, most uh, thanks to uh, deep neural networks, right? Um, so I would say that's 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 where they're better. The second uh, thing where I wouldn't say they're better, but they allow you to scale is when you have enormous amounts of data and you can't look at all the data. Then it would be better to have a huge workforce, an infinite workforce to look at that data, but it's also not practical, right? It'd be super expensive, super slow. 
uh, but the output would be better. But since you can't, you might as well use machine learning to at least do a first pass at looking at the data, identifying some patterns, classifying or ranking it in a certain way that after that can be uh, uh, looked at by humans using this first informative uh, metadata that was computed from uh, the machine learning algorithm. Um, but again, like I would rather have a huge workforce if I could and if it was uh, practical because there's a lot more knowledge in that than uh, the, uh, the those machine learning algorithms that we use to go through the huge amount of data. So what we found works uh, at Sama is a combination of the, of the two. Um, it's a good idea to have a lot of data. Start with that. Start with some of the, uh, you know, the models that allow you to um, go through that data, maybe like sort it or rank it in a certain order, and then have humans look at uh, part of what the analysis uh, of that first phase uh, gave you to uh, uh, realign it to, <laughs> and then to make the ultimate decisions uh, around what should be annotated, what shouldn't be annotated, what should be looked at again, what ne requires clarification and everything um, before it actually goes to the next stage, which is the pure annotation or validation phase. And do you see a, a reduction in the needs of humans in the loop by the evolution of AI just being better and better? So I believe we're going to need less humans per loop, okay? Because there's a bunch of automation, a bunch of other tools, including ML tools, that are going to make this uh, work uh, faster and, and more scalable. But I also believe there's going to be a lot lo more loops, right? So the ratio uh, definitely changes, but the sheer number of use cases, the sheer number of work, uh, um, uh, workflows or, or, or use cases, if you want, uh, are, are going to explode where you might need now one human in a loop kind of supervising or even teaching 10 models at a time, even uh, 100 models at a time. But then you're going to have like, hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions of models to actually uh, supervise at once. So uh, ultimately, the sheer amount of, of people that you need uh, uh, actually probably grows, uh, but, but they can do a lot more than what they're capable of doing uh, today. And you mentioned use cases, and I, I'd love to talk to you about a specific use case that you mentioned to me earlier that you were uh, being involved with, which is the training of autonomous vehicle or building the data sets for it. And for lots of people, autonomous vehicle is something that is becoming more and more real and impressive. And it's like kind of the terminator of AI. Like it's what we see at, as like something, I don't know, a real use case, a clear real use case of artificial intelligence. And I wonder if you could share a bit more on how is such a system trained? Like what is the data required, the kind of the kinds of data and if there are multiple systems or multiple type of uh, input that, that it needs to be trained. So basically, what data does an autonomous vehicle needs to be autonomous? Sure, we could talk about this a little bit, but that, this is a, a topic that could spawn over like multiple uh, podcast hours. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. In essence, there's really two parts to an autonomous vehicle uh, working. One is the perception. Uh, part, which is collecting and analyzing all the data that goes to, through the uh, typical sensors you find on a car. So what are those typical sensors? Uh, you have cameras, right? Like, you know, Tesla only uses cameras. You have cameras and a set of cameras that look at the, the world around you. But there's also um, something called a LiDAR, uh, which is another type of sensor uh, based on, on light, um, which um, instead of getting uh, creating a 2D images uh, of pixel, actually generates a, three, a 3D world um, of what we call points. So they're typically called uh, point clouds. Uh, you can also use uh, radar. You can use, uh, other, also use other technologies, but let, let's stick right now for, for, with uh, 2D cameras and, and LiDAR, right? So um, that is the information and in sensory system that is used and then processed for uh, uh, making decisions on like, uh, uh, you know, well, for at least understanding the world around. Are there cars around? Are there obstacles? Is there an imminent, imminent danger? How close are the things around uh, the ego vehicle, et cetera? And then a second uh, part of the system is the decision-making system, basically. The planning, right? Now that I know all these things, how do I get where I need to go immediate, like, uh, immediately and on the long term? Like I might want to get over there, 
which is pretty far away, but what are these different steps that I need to take, knowing what I know at this particular stage and knowing also that the world around me will change as I get closer and closer to that uh, more longer term uh, objective of getting to that uh, another uh, uh, to, to my destination, right? So those two things are usually separate when you're actually tackling uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. I, I'm not a pure expert uh, in that domain, but I do know that um, in these two phases, there's also a bunch of sub-modules uh, that are used, right? So think of like at the lowest level, just being having a system that's just able to identify pedestrians because pedestrians are very important, right? You need to identify them. And then other levels of abstractions around this, uh, maybe you have something that does the the, um, the 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 prediction of where the pedestrian is going, just to make sure that the pedestrian is not walking in front of your car, and your, it, the chances that it will walk in front of your car anytime soon are very 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 low, right? Those are the things that are built on top of each other, and and that's how the industry usually uh, works. Now, for us, what we're seeing in AV uh, autonomous vehicles that we're not seeing yet in other uh, in, in other uh, domains and other fields is uh, that use of the 3D point clouds, like those LIDARs. The, real, the reason being because LIDARs are still very, very expensive, right? Um, and what is fascinating for us is that um, annotating LIDARs is actually a very difficult task. Imagine like now we have our annotators, uh, they need to understand our 3D world. It's no longer looking at an image, right? It's long, looking at a 3D world, which is very sparse. You have points. I don't know if we could put a, an image uh, at some point just to show what it looks like. You have points in that 3D world that um, don't necessarily, uh, are not necessarily easy to recognize as a, as a shape, right? As a car. A and yet, um, our annotators are asked to put a, a cuboid, a, a, you know, a three-dimensional shape <laughs> around uh, those different vehicles. Uh, around the different uh, pedestrians uh, with very little uh, clear information for humans. So what they do is experience matters a lot over here, training matters a lot, and they will use the 2D images from the camera's sensors to guide a little bit uh, their, their, annotation, uh, their annotation process. Do you think using only cameras and LiDAR is enough to download the skills of, of human drivers? Or like, is it promising and, and do you see it going on the roads? I think at some point we'll get there. The exact combination of sensors that it will take, I don't think we figured it out yet. There's a lot, okay, we've probably invested more like collectively than a hundred billion dollars in, in that. And yet how many uh, autonomous vehicles do you see uh, driving around? Especially you and I live in Montreal. Mm. There's uh, what, we got about uh, 12 inches of <laughs> snow yesterday. I really don't see any of these like fancy California style uh, car cars that are driving in San Francisco being able to, to drive today. So that we have a long, long way to go still. Uh, which sensors we will be using? Um, I, I believe that it will be a combination of things. If you listen to Elon Musk, he tell you that two cameras is enough, one, for, one to uh, represent each eye of a, of a face, right? Uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily uh, necessarily going to be the case for uh, uh, for the foreseeable futures. Just the, the same way that like planes don't fly like birds do at all, and yet they yeah. work, right? <laughs> so I think LiDAR has a, a role to play because it's an interesting technology. They're still too expensive, unfortunately. Uh, as the price goes down, uh, we might see like vehicles worth not one or two or three LiDARs, but now a dozen or, or half a dozen, and that might help for redundancy. Um, and then, yeah, other technologies uh, such as a radar can help as well. And then there, mm. there are probably others that, uh, that, are, that I'm not mentioning right now. And th this may be a bit far-fetched and out of topic, but I just also wonder why we are trying to, to create autonomous vehicles, whereas instead we could create autonomous subway stations or whatever that is much simpler and could be much more efficient than each having our own car that is trying to replicate human driving skills. I I have a, a very personal opinion on this. So, you know, please uh, take it with a grain of salt over here. I believe to come up with a revolution in, in mobility, which I think is, is a noble uh, uh, cause, where I'm not sure I agree is with people saying that we're trying to get autonomous vehicles to save lives. Because between you and I, if we invested $100 billion 
in trying to save lives on the roads, we would have like come up with a much more successful means of doing so, right? Limiting speed, limiting people from like uh, forbidding or like uh, uh, not forbidding, but uh, stopping people from from driving drunk with like very very simple technology. So that I don't think is a really good uh, uh, motivation. Uh, well, at least one that I don't really uh, buy. But I think we're doing it because it's a really interesting technical challenge. Like JFK would say, like we're doing it because it's hard. Like you know. It, we're not doing it because easy, but it's because it's hard. And I believe there's a lot of value in this. Eventually, I think it will, it will uh, come with a, a set of advantage in, in, in completely changing uh, how we see and, and use mobility. But that also is going to take a while before before we get there. So, so that's that's my opinion on this. Uh, from a pure technical point of view, it's really, really cool. Should we not do it? No, we should absolutely do it, just like we should try to go to, to the moon and, and beyond. Uh, but are we really actually tackling those problems that a lot of us say we're trying to tackle? That's where I call uh, a little bit of, of BS, uh, at least on, on some of the, uh, the, the people that I've heard talk about this. I have a final question for you to go back a bit on more applied and realistic use cases of AI, just to, to finish with a, a loop. And uh, since you are like the vision expert and, and mostly dealing with what our, our eyes see, could you first give some real world example of where AI is currently being used in, in the vision industry? And second question, second part of the question is, where do you see it coming into our lives that isn't yet uh, helping us? Yeah, for sure. So just as a note, like as a funny anecdote over here, you describe me as a computer vision expert or a vision expert. My background is actually in haptics, uh, which yeah. is the, the sense of, of touch with computers, which is a completely different sense, which I'm happy to talk about at some point if you if you want to. In terms of computer vision, like, so what are the uh, current applications? It's pretty much everywhere, right? In security, for instance, for tracking like uh, people's from one, uh, one frame to the next or from one uh, room to the other. Um, computer vision is also used in, in stores that where there's no cashier at right? like the, the, the checkout, the self-checkout uh, stores, uh, for instance. Uh, on, uh, in manufacturing, in, in, on assembly lines uh, to detect uh, flaws on whatever is going on the, uh, on the assembly line, right? Um, there's, so there's, there's really applications in every, uh, in every single domain and every single uh, vertical. Uh, what, where are we going to see some of this uh, in terms of net new in the future? Um, uh, I mean, I, I also think uh, everywhere. So any, anything where um, having a, a vision system that is automated uh, can benefit the business, we'll start seeing uh, these, uh, uh, these systems uh, appearing. Um, so, uh, and I know like this is kind of a vague answer, but I think it's just so broad that yeah. uh, I leave it to the uh, imagination of your listeners to, to come up with their real application. I'm sure a lot of them are already working on some of these. Yeah. It's just that, for example, if we take my mother, for instance, she doesn't know a lot about artificial intelligence and to her, it doesn't exist yet really, or like she's not using it. Whereas every time she picks up her iPhone, it like lots of things are are using artificial intelligence, and so I, I love to to have more concrete examples of what's currently being used. And of course, security was a good example. But do you think you can quickly find out one that is not currently possible, but you think will become possible soon? Um, in terms of like some other examples, let's start with that, right? And it, again, it really depends on the definition of, of artificial intelligence. What we call our AI today was not AI like, you know, uh, 10 years ago. And sometimes uh, a month ago, it wasn't called AI. Yeah. But, um, you know, like your iPhone right now, it unlocks itself by recognizing your face. Some people could call this artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of tricks that involve with this, not pure intelligence, right? But like just the fact that it recognizes you and you don't need to put your password in. That's that's uh, that's definitely uh, one example. Uh, if we go back, like if your mom listens to Netflix, right, the recommendation system on Netflix is also uh, at some point was called artificial intelligence. It's nothing modern, something that had been existed in existence for a long time. But this idea of being able to, uh, based on your past viewing and your past scoring of, of, of movies and, and others, like others scoring as well, um, uh, being able to, uh, to, to recommend uh, what you should be watching uh, next on your streaming uh, service, for instance. Those are all examples. So, so it's, pretty much, it's pretty much everywhere. As if what's coming, 
um, uh, I mean, that might be uh, that might be uh, trickier, but you can think of like waking up in the morning, for instance, in your house, uh, and um, and everything is adjusted to uh, your liking. So obviously, it would require a, a change in hardware in your in your house. But let's let's uh, let's pretend that this is happening, right? You're greeted in the morning. You go down. Your coffee's been made, and it, it, it's made differently uh, on Saturdays than it is on on Mondays because you have more time to drink it. It's different, um, and and you you haven't had to configure any of that stuff. It's just learned from your preferences. It's just making suggestion from what type of person you are and which category you fall, and it's using uh, data from other people in an anonymous way, but just to try to find uh, what would suit you uh, best. You know, these systems might or might not have vision. In the case that I just described, you probably don't need vision for this, but it's, you know, the same concept applies to uh, uh, to, to vision systems uh, uh, just yeah. as well, I think. And it might also have haptics. I, I've actually listened to, you, to a podcast that you've been in where you talked a lot about haptics, so I didn't want to, like, repeat and talk about this again, but it's definitely something super interesting. Another sensory input that I believe we don't really use that much uh, these days. And so, yeah, I I would love to just quickly touch this topic. Where uh, could could you give a bit more information on how are haptics used, or what's what's challenging with this sensory input and its link with its potential and link with artificial intelligence? Yeah. So first, I appreciate the point of like touching that topic. Um, there's there's so many puns we can do with haptics, right? Yeah, so you know, I was just listening to Fei Fei Liu, who's a leader in, in in computer vision and artificial intelligence, a professor at uh, at Stanford. Right? And um, in one of the podcasts I listened to, she was talking about how vision is probably one of the reasons. And when we when animals evolved, that well, like got vision basically, the, the sense of sight, right? That probably explained how like there was a huge jump after that uh, in uh, in evolution. And and I kind of disagree. I, I agree that vision is a super important part of our lives and a cornerstone story of, a, of, what, of what we do. Um, but I think it's just because it affords for a lot of information to be uh, as a sensor to, to come in, right? A lot, like all these pixels, if you want, that are being processed. But I actually think that haptics is just as important, if not more important. But because uh, before you need to, to, to see, you probably need to feel, to know what's around you. And that's what the tense, sense of touch is, right? Uh, being able to uh, not only uh, understand your immediate environment around you, but also understand yourselves. Without haptics, uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to stand, right? Uh, all your proper system, which is what allows you to feel your, your, your own muscles, your own body, if you didn't have that, which is mm -hmm. the sense of touch, well, we will all be on the floor, not moving at all, right? Uh, so uh, the the, dif the the big difference between, um, I guess, the, the sense of, of, of sight and the sense of touch uh, is twofold. One is like the sense of, of sight allows you for like remote processing. You're seeing stuff that's very far from you. Whereas sense is like, the sense of sight is more, uh, touch, sorry, is more about your immediate surroundings. Because if you can't reach it, you can't feel it, right? And the second thing is the processing, the amount of information, like from a pure kind of like number of bits, like that come in, uh, the sense of sight, like is, is a, an order, two orders of magnitude bigger, if not more than the sense of touch where, you know, obviously you don't get a lot of information coming to uh, your, your, mm -hmm. your skin, but that information is just as important. As we said, you wouldn't be able to stand if you didn't have it. Yeah. And it's also much more, I think, uh, loaded with emotional content, right? We touch babies. We touched our, our loved ones. So those are the, the two differences. But um, maybe we keep all this uh, topic for, for another time because, as you can tell, I, I, I rapidly get excited about the happiness. Yeah. And just for autonomous driving as well, for example, if we take yesterday where uh, there were black eyes everywhere that we cannot see, but if we feel it, we, we, we hear both hear and feel the... the the, the gas pedal going farther, but the, we hear the, the wheel spinning and just starts, we start feeling that the, the car go, going sideways. And it's like something that cannot be only done with two cameras. No, I think a, a, another great example of this is in, uh, in um, uh, surgical uh, procedures. Yeah. 
especially remote surgical procedures, right? Um, you, we now have like machines that allow you to do a, a surgery uh, from a distance remotely, right? Someone is in a hospital under the machine and as a surgeon, you're in a completely different city in another uh, hospital. It doesn't actually be, need to be a hospital, but like say a command center where you're actually doing uh, the surgery remotely. Um, using uh, vision alone won't be enough. You can see it, but the surgeons are going to ask like, yeah, but I want to feel what I'm cutting because otherwise I can't actually yeah. navigate. I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, this idea of using multiple senses uh, is, is obviously not new. That's how we operate as, as uh, humans. And that's also why I think we're going to see in some sense uh, uh, more and more of these uh, multimodal uh, systems that kind of combine uh, multiple modalities because there's a redundancy of, of signals in there that makes things more reliable uh, and, and more efficient and, and of, uh, of better quality mm. uh, to make the natural progression in, in, in the next phases of, of AI. And I, I assume that the diverse, the sensors, and the, the more sensors we have, the better. Just like, for instance, maybe a car could be in the end, in, in the future, better than us just because it has LiDAR and other types of sensors that we don't really have and yeah it's just really exciting to i hope to see how things coming more and more into our lives just i i guess we do have some applications that that are using it just with our phone and other things and i also worked at uh, cae healthcare uh, during my internships and i was uh, testing and doing qa for the some surgical applications where you had to cut tissues and feel you you were literally like feeling cutting through like meat i don't know but like it it was quite realistic and it's it's a very cool field to try trying to replicate tissues or just textures it's it's something yeah incredibly cool <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And in VR, we're going to see this more and more. People are going yeah. to be asking, like, oh, of course, today you feel like the, like what a gun feels like when you're shooting, like in a game, for instance, like a VR game and stuff like that. But that's really just scratching the surface of what we can do by trying to reproduce the sense of touch in uh, in uh, virtual vir virtual reality. Amazing. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your your time and just all the amazing insights you shared. And I, I would be super excited to to talk more about haptics sometime soon in the future if if you are too. So yeah, thanks a lot for joining me on this discussion and sharing all that you have in, in your mind. It's been a real pleasure, Louis. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm always uh, ready to talk about haptics whenever you're ready. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.